You are watching Procurement and Supply Chain Live. Now, our next event is a fireside chat, and the subject's a big one, supply chain sustainability. Now, taking part uh, will be Nidra Dixon, who's Global Supply Inclusion and Sustainability, sustainability Lead at Accenture. Uh, Nidra has been with Accenture for 21 years, works with small businesses, suppliers, and subcontractors across the world. Uh, she's also helped grow Accenture's diverse supplier development program globally. And also joining us today will be Maurizio Condro, Head of Procurement and Sustainability at AB InBev, the world's largest brewer. Um, Maurizio has 10 years experience in retail, blockchain, procurement, among other things. He is also the co-founder of Ocean Bottle, a UK social enterprise that is leading the fight to protect our oceans from plastic waste. So welcome, Nidra, and welcome, Maurizio. It's lovely to have you on board. How are you both? Doing well. Thank you for having me. Great to be You're here, welcome. Sean. Thank you so much. Hi, Maurizio. Nice, nice to meet you both. Um, so uh, with you know, this is a big subject that's under discussion today. Um, it's something that you know, it seems to, it does cut across every single aspect of business now, doesn't it? Um, it's a it's a mission critical aspect of business, which, you know, wasn't always the case. Um, but I'd like to start things off maybe by asking uh, you, Nidra. So I, I mentioned in the intro there that you're uh, heavily involved in Accenture's supplier inclusion and sustainability program. I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about that. Yes, actually, um, thank you. What I, I think I have a really unique role within Accenture is that I really get a chance to not only find some of the small and diverse owned businesses, but I get to integrate them successfully into our supply chain. And now what we find that as imperative because we've seen the disruption in the supply chain. So I have to look at how are we looking at the underrepresented communities? How is that really going to make sure that we're sustainable for the future? And so what we've been able to do is look at innovation and look at how some of these small businesses can now collaborate and co-innovate with such large complex organizations as Accenture. And we start to look at the human rights side of everything. We begin to look at, you know, where's our renewable energy and how are we making sure that is flowing down to those underrepresented communities? So I hope today we get a chance to explore some of that, how we have leveraged the small and diverse businesses globally at Accenture to help not only with the disruption that we're seeing, but the innovation in the supply chain. I'd love to hear more about that, Nidra. Um, and... Uh... So I'd like to put a, some, a question to you, Maurizio. Um, you know, the, we've been living in a in a world that's been riven with you know disruption and upheaval um, for the last you know couple of years, and um, it's changed a lot, hasn't it? It's changed the way business is done. Um, you know, remote working, hybrid working, but how has um, supply chain disruption impacted you know sustainability in terms of how we're moving forward with sustainability i i think that's a great point john and and to your point at the beginning about how sustainability is now being integrated into our companies as a mission critical i would say it goes further than that i i would say it's survival critical not not only for for us as 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 humans but also for for companies if you know, they want to adapt and really survive the next generation of challengers that comes ahead but to answer your question i think the disruptions we've seen through COVID, through everything that's going on in the world is nothing that i've ever experienced in my career we're seeing congestions in all types of transport, uh, delays in lead time from machinery and raw materials. And of course, prices are going up throughout the supply chain. And I think this is obviously having an impact on sustainability efforts for very simple reasons at the beginning, which may be just 
where capital is being uh, positioned inside the company. Because now we're seeing more investment discussions that talk about the short term rather than maybe some sustainability investment that in, in some scenarios get pushed into the long term. But I really do think this is just a minor bump in the road because this has actually helped us to, to understand the importance of a sustainable supply chain. And not only because the consumers demand it, but because it's socially, financially, the best thing for the company. Being reliant on fossil fuels, having those carbon taxes now being brought up in many countries will basically put a dependence on higher risks, which come from not being sustainable. So I think current dispositions about being able to adapt, being more creative, really stretching money as much as, as we can, and most importantly, finding good partnership within our whole supply chain shows that this is required for a sustainable future. So, I mean, to bring it all up, yes, disruptions are happening, but I don't think on the long term it would affect our sustainability goals. Do you think disruption in some ways has focused people's minds on the problems a little bit more? I think so. I, I think at the beginning, I, I think people are realizing how global the supply chain is. And something that might have been invisible or transparent a couple of years ago is now in the forefront of every newspaper that everyone's reading. And I think people understand that sustainability, uh, the more they learn about it, they realize it's not something that we can solve on our own. And this has brought together the necessity of bringing everyone together to solve these solutions that it's not about anymore about being the best at sustainability or trying to get there faster because everyone needs to do it if you really want to see results. Sure. And um, just sticking with the pandemic and disruption um, for a minute, I'd be interested to know, Nidra, you know, has has all of that, of the, you know, the problems of the past two years, has that changed the way you work, the way you approach things, you know, in terms of your supplier inclusion and sustainability program? Absolutely. It has changed the work. Um, and I think what was just mentioned is that we've realized we can't do this alone. And so that partnership is more crucial than ever. And what we're finding is that it can be a partnership on many different levels. So when you look at many corporations who have joined together um, to, you know, for a solution, also we're finding where those small and diverse owned businesses that are coming in to fill those critical gaps. So we've changed the way we work and now really relying on some of these small businesses to not only partner with, but we're going to the table to be innovative with them. And we did see that with COVID where we saw they were able to be more nimble and able to get PPE equipment to first responders at a faster rate than some of the large corporations. But then when we saw that we could partner together with them on a global basis, which I think was also brought up that this is just bigger than some pockets of the, the world, that it's on a global stage, we now realize that's how we're going to have to work for the future. So it's forced us to begin to plan in a strategy that we are going to have to come to the table together with these small businesses if we're going to have a strategy to make this sustainable on all levels. So, I mean, yeah, I mean the pandemic has brought some terrible challenges and had some awful outcomes, but it, it hasn't all been bad, has it? I, I suppose. Um, but um, I, I'm just going to shift attention uh, uh, away from disruption for a minute and uh, just get back on to uh, sustainability and move on to scopes one, two and three emissions. Um, now, I mean, you hear so much about scopes uh, one, two, but particularly three, scope three emissions, of course, being those which emit from uh, supply chains and which can account for up to 80% of most organizations' uh, carbon emissions. Do you, do you think, Maurizio, that um, scope one, two, and three emissions are getting enough attention? Do you think we're moving forward quickly enough in that area? I think the, the comprehension and the understanding of this has 
increased massively this past two years. Uh, I think all across Europe, three years ago, no one was talking about this. And it might have seemed like an alien language if you start speaking about scope one, two, and three, and what does that mean? But I think more and more people are bringing this forward, not only us as a company to our suppliers, but also some of our customers are bringing it to us when we want to do business with them. And, and being on that, but being on that side of the conversation, I don't think it's enough. I think it's more about what is the impact you can actually do on the scopes. I think you've made a great point for some companies, scope three can be up to 80%. For us, for example, as an FMCG, it's up to 90%. And that scope three goes throughout our whole supply chain. So it's super important that we work together with all of them to act on, on, on these issues. Uh, for example, uh, a couple of years ago, we launched a project called Eclipse, where we look to do exactly this, bring everyone to the table, not only the people who are our suppliers, but all back through the supply chains or who are their suppliers, the suppliers before them, who are the transport companies that bring us all together, who are the, the, the retailers that then use our product and use refrigeration or use more of that energy at the end. And I think that really made us realize that most of the problems that we're facing are, are not just on, on ourselves and it's more for everyone. And if we all get together to try and tackle it, it's just a better way to do it. And to Nidra's point, we've also understood the importance of not just these big conglomerates around the world, but also the small SMEs and the importance of having those local suppliers. Uh, for example, we, we launched something called the 100 Plus Accelerator uh, about four years ago globally, but now we're doing it locally in Europe. And we've partnered with like-minded uh, sustainability-focused companies like Ball Corporation, Siemens, Collier Group, uh, Bain and & Company. And what we're doing is actually looking for innovations, small companies with even an idea who are just looking to solve some of the sustainable problems. And we give them funding to be able to escalate further and then solve some of, of, our, of, our, of, of the problems that we have at a global level. Sure. I mean, how much time do you spend talking about emissions with your customers, Nidra? Um, just like that, it's it's all the time. Um, what our CEO, Julie Sweet, has put together is her 360 value. And in that 360 value meter, we are definitely talking to our clients around the scope three. And, you know, with us being consultants, it really started along on our business travel. So if we think about some of the things that everyone can begin to do, it was like, where can you start? And so we wanted to make sure that everyone, not only at Accenture was doing this, but we were also bringing this value and talking to it with our clients. So I think that's the same, you know, was just said is that we have to make sure that we're looking at what we're doing with our own internal um, footprint around this, but then how do we take this to our clients? And so that is where we've also been doing that and putting out our scope three emissions is so important, but because we're such a global firm, it's something that we have to do to each client. So what we've done in the 360 value is to make sure this is embedded in, that this doesn't be something that we're looking at to, as a later part, but how can we embed this in everything we do? And she's how she's also looked at it around inclusion and diversity, and as well as our sustainability in all of our ESG goals. Sure. Now, I mean, one thing that always strikes me about you know scopes one, two, and three emissions is, I mean, everybody a lot of focus is on the scope three emissions because they count for so much in terms of the total. But if every company took responsibility for their scope one and two emissions, then you can't help thinking that the scope three emissions would take care of themselves, wouldn't they? Uh, and it seems like sometimes, it, you know, you might be coming at the problem from, or you could come at the problem from more than one direction, couldn't you? I mean, do you, I don't know if you, you'd share that view or not. I'll put that yeah, to the floor, I, by the way. No, no, I, I think, Sean, that's, that's right on point. And I think that's something that, everyone needs to keep in mind. And 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 th there's two things to it, correct? If everyone solves their scope one and two, all of scope three will be done. But some companies have an easier way to do so. So we also need to keep that into consideration that if, if we can lend a helping hand or accelerate that with some of our partners, we need to do that. 
But obviously, uh, the focus needs to be on what can I do myself and start implementing that as fast as possible. But then, and then secondly, or in parallel, I would say is how can we do this for the rest of, of the supply chain? And and companies such as as AB InBev, we have that responsibility. As you said, being the largest brewer in the world, we need to put that step forward and be examples. So we can tell them we're doing this. We want to encourage you to do the same. How can we help you? But but obviously. Yes, let's have everyone fix our, our company first. Sure. And I mean, this, uh, the whole sustainability thing, the, the, the global drive towards net zero, it's all about embedding practices and programs and, uh, you know, into operations uh, and making them an integral part of what, what businesses do. So I'd, I'd be interested, Nidra, you know, to, to learn a little bit about how you know Accenture's supplier inclusion and sustainability program is helping to embed these practices and making sure that they become very much part of businesses' operations on a day-to-day -day basis going forward. Absolutely. One of the things that we're the I, I would say if I look at the very first thing that we've done to embed this is we look at transparency. And I think we have to be transparent on everything that we're doing. So when we took a look at the being transparent and how we're going to begin to report all of this out to our stakeholders, our shareholders, I think that was one of the first things that we had to do was take a look internal and assess where we were. And I go back to our 360 value is that when we're looking at everything that we're doing, from any of our operation sides to anything with procurement and especially looking at inclusive procurement, how do we begin to embed this in? And one of the things that we started to do is looking at all of our sourcing deals, everything, we're looking at our partners, we're looking at everyone that we begin to work with and start reporting on this as we started setting those goals out. And so once you're looking at how you begin to define it, how are you going to set those targets to be net neutral? And how are you going to completely begin to be transparent? And to me, when you start becoming transparent is when you really know that, okay, this is something we can begin to partner and look at. So that was what I would say we started to do first. And from there, it was, let's bring this in. The way we look at um, sustainability, it's the next digital. So we're now doing everything digital. If you look at how we've been working lately, that is where we want to have sustainability at Accenture. It needs to become in everything that we do. And so in doing that, it's not an option. It's not a choice. It's something that we've made sure that everyone coming into our firm understands our goals, where we are, and how we can bring this to our clients. So, I mean, it's interesting that you mentioned, you know, clarity and transparency and uh, on st sustainability, because if we're, if everybody's not singing from the same sort of uh, song sheet, then uh, it's very difficult to see how everybody's going to move forward together. And I was interested, in Maurizio, in knowing, you know, what you think about um, sustainability standards um you know who should who needs to be setting the standards uh how, and how should they be implemented uh, so that everybody can be moving forward together with the you know the same ideas and appreciation of what it is to be sustainable yeah no i i agree completely with, uh how important it is to be to be transparent and to be able to say this is the things that we can tackle this is the things that we don't know how to tackle and we're looking for help and how to do so for example, in our breweries, we've identified 29 different technologies that will help us get to carbon neutral brewing. And some of those we even invented it ourselves and put it out into the market. But some of them have been obviously from other experts around, around the world that we need to implement on our own. But when talking about standards and benchmarking, I think there's a lot of them. Obviously, every one of them has a lot of positives. We have GRI, TCFD, SISB, CDP. I can go through the whole alphabet. And, and But for me, honestly, the most important benchmark is net zero. And when will your company reach it? 
because even those standards are important and something we we must all do for transparency's sake. Uh, actions about for, that every country and every company is doing will be completely different. For example, it might make sense to us to invest in green hydrogen in the UK, which is what we're doing now. But in the Canaries, where transport vehicles are smaller, it will make a lot more sense to go electric. Or for example, water stewardship is becoming more and more important in countries in Africa or in Latin America. But in the UK, there might be much more focus on packaging, which uses a lot of energy and a lot of resources to create. So at the end result for everyone must be net zero. How to get there, how to benchmark will be very different between companies, but everyone needs to assess their own, bi their own businesses and provide reporting on how to get there. I mean, that's absolutely right. I mean, you, you know, you, you, you ran through half the alphabet there when you were, you know, mentioning standards and, you know, I, I, I've written about this widely as well. You know, you have, companies like EcoVardis as well don't you are providing ratings and and you have the ISO standards and who feed into all the international uh representative groups on standards as well and I mean is this something that you know you encourage your customers to be involved with Nidra Yes, absolutely. Um, and I agree, you know, companies are really going to to have to do that, you know, be with their net zero. And I think now most companies will have to double the pace of their emissions reduction. Um, and those are some of the things that we're looking at and helping our clients do that. And we know that a big change of that is going to come with technology. And I think um, in really looking at the technology industry and how we collaborate on that um, and looking to deploy some of the technology to reduce the GHG emissions, you know, of zero by 2050. And that's going to be where we have to collaborate and why we want to bring this to our clients, even those that might not have begun that journey. Part of it is us not waiting on them. If we're able to go in and to help collaborate, we're going to bring it to them, even if they're not asking, just because of the pace and how mission critical it is right now. Because I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? When you uh, when you have seismic changes in businesses, I guess, first of all, you have to evangelize the change. They have to make people understand why it is they need it rather than what it is you're offering them. Do you do much of that? Yes, um, definitely. So it's it's we do it with even if you look at the entire ESG, we're looking at how we can bring all of it to them. But again, I go back to that collaboration and where I have such a unique position in is that I also get to bring in those SMEs that we have really had a chance to develop. And we have a program where we do develop a lot of the SMEs to not only um, come in and help Accenture with our journey, but then we can also do that for our clients. So we've had clients and SMEs that have, you know, helped in designing solar panels, um, helping with some of the calculations around scope three. So it's been very integral for us to give different ways of talking to this on different landscapes, different levels with our clients, because around global, it's going to need those local um, businesses to work together. So in every opportunity that we're doing now, it is brought to our clients. And we're, again, I go back to being extremely transparent on where we are in this journey so that we can begin to help our other clients be just as transparent. Sure. I mean, that's that's the key, isn't it? I mean, it, you know, it, every company has is on the same journey, aren't they, really, towards net zero? And so sort of on that note, um, Maurizio, I mean, AB and Bev is a huge company, isn't it? It's the world's largest brewer. Um, th so, you know, this, this is a considerable undertaking for multinational companies like yourselves um, to move towards net zero. What kind of things are you doing, you know, to to help you along that, that journey? So I think in 2017, I think it's where we really did uh, a big, I mean, we, we've always seen sustainability as part of our business. And I think Nidra said it, I think it's embedded in everything that we do now because it has to be. 
Uh, but in 2017, we did something called a uh, materiality assessment, where we really dug deep and understand where is where we can give the most value and where is what most value needs to be given for us to become the sustainable company. So we we envisioned what we called our 2025 sustainability goals. So things we wanted to accomplish by then. And they were focused around four pillars, most importantly, obviously, around climate change, but also about our farmers and our agricultures, around our water stewardship and around packaging. And I think we had very specific goals that we wanted to accomplish by 2025. But we've gone a step further since then. And last year, we made our announcement for our net zero campaign, which will be by 2040. But it was obviously important to separate what we're doing as AP and BIP as a whole group to what we're doing at individual zones and even individual countries. Because sometimes you can accelerate some countries faster because you might have more resources or you might have more government subsidies or, 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 or better partnerships. Even though the big goal is there, it's important what we're doing locally. So just to take an example in, in the UK where, where it's where I'm located. Last year, we're already brewing with 100% renewable electricity from two solar farms and one wind turbine inside our brewery. We removed over 850 tons of plastic waste, so no using any 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 plastic on, on our beers. But we're also big believers, for example, in, in upcycling. Uh, it, in the past, uh, we, we used to give our spent grains to farmers to use as cattle feed, but now we're taking it a step further and we're investing to transform that into more functional ingredients such as sustainable protein that can now be used in several application and maybe reduce the, the use of soy protein, which is only grown in about two countries in the world. Or other example is how we use a straw from a barley that we then used to dispose, but now we realize we can transform it into sustainable folding cartons that can carry our beers. Or even not looking at our own systems, but how can we make use of fishing nets that are wasted in the sea and used as plastic and collect them and us actually transforming them into crates to transport some of our beers in our renewable system. So I, I think there's a lot of inspiration that we can take. And, and to the point that we were discussing before, the reporting that we see from other companies allows us to be inspired, allows us to, to shed visibility on some startups that are doing interesting things around the world and really make the most out of it. Uh, but this is this is something that we need to tackle every day and we need to find new innovative and curious solutions every day. So looking forward to the challenge. Well, it sounds like you're making great headway on that front as a company, Maurizio. So I, I'm going to um, just put one final question to you both. Um, what do you think is the biggest single challenge facing sustainability in supply chain? I'll put that to you, Nidra, first. Well, um, one that I would say I think is embracing change. Um, I think everyone is is being bold and, and really setting their net zero emissions and you know, moving to zero waste. But I think we are going to have to understand that it is a global um, change that we're going to have to do. We're going to have to embrace technology to help us reach these goals. And we're going to, I think one of the other biggest challenges we're facing is that it's going to show a different level of collaboration from everyone that we might not have seen in the past. And that would be from maybe partners that we haven't seen to collaborate with before. So we'll start seeing that different level of, of that sure. landscape, but I think embracing change. And uh, Maurizio, briefly, um, what do you think is the biggest challenge we're facing on sustainability? I, I would say very similar to Nidra. I think it's all about selflessness and collaboration. I think we need to realize this is not a competition, even though there are competitors trying to do the same thing. And this is something that we all need to do together because it's, it, it, it's a matter of finding solutions, not being the best at it. So at the end, it's about bringing everyone together to the table to be open, to discuss sustainable solutions for a better world for everyone. So I think that's the most important thing. We're past the capitalist age where you have to have a pattern, you have to be the best. We need solutions for everyone. Well, that's great. Well, I'm afraid we're gonna have to uh, draw a line under it there. Um, but 
Nidra, thank you very much. Maurizio, thank you for your time and your insight. On behalf of everybody watching this at Sustainability and Supply Chain Live, thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Nidra. Thank you. Now, don't go anywhere because our next speaker is up shortly.